Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar uh, called Engaging Communities, What's Involved and How It's Done. And our apologies for starting a little bit late today. My name is Mary Stathopoulos, and I'm a Senior Research Officer here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Today, we will hear about community engagement, what it involves, how it's done, and how it can improve outcomes for children and families. Before I introduce our speakers today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting. In Melbourne, the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be participating today. I would also like to alert you to some brief housekeeping details. One of the core functions of the CFCA Information Exchange is to share knowledge. So I would like to warmly invite everyone to submit questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar today. We will have time to respond to your questions at the end of the presentation, so please do stay tuned for that. We'd also like you to continue the conversation that we begin here today. To support this, we've set up a forum on our website where you can discuss the ideas and the issues that have been raised. And you can submit additional questions for our presenters at that time as well. We will send you a link to the forum at the conclusion of today's presentation. Please also remember the webinar today is being recorded and the audio transcript and presentation slides will be made available on our website and our YouTube channel in due course. Accessible versions will also be available. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Today we have Sue West, who is Associate Director of the Centre for Community Health, Child Health sorry, at the Royal Children's Hospital and Senior Manager of Policy and Service Development at Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Sue leads major research initiatives to inform policy, service delivery, professional practice and parenting, translation and knowledge exchange projects, training and development activities, service systems innovation projects, and policy-related research. Dr. Tim Moore is a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Community Health Child Health. An experienced educational and developmental psychologist, Tim has had a long involvement in the development and delivery of early childhood intervention services for young children with developmental disabilities and their families. Today, we will also be joined by Angela Sayer, a parent who was actively involved in the co-design of her local child and family centre in Tasmania and continues to be active in her community today. Please join me in giving our presenters a very warm virtual welcome. Okay, hi, my name's Tim Moore. I've just been introduced. Lovely to be here. Thank you for the opportunity for AFES to allow us to present on this highly important topic. The way we're going to structure this is I'm going to run through the content of the paper that uh, has been published um, by AFES uh, and do that in about 20 minutes, um, highlighting some of the important issues. Then I'm going to hand over to Sue and Angela, who's online from Tasmania, and we're going to talk about an exemplary um, community engagement project with a particular focus on uh, what Angela, as a participant in it, um, how what that experience was like. So we're going to have a quick look in this first section then at the context in which we're talking about what's been tried, definitions of what's a community and what's community engagement, rationale, what makes community engagement effective? What does it look like in practice? And some implications before we turn to the example. So quite briskly moving through this. The background issue, the context is, we've had growing calls for governments and service systems uh, to seek greater community engagement in the design and delivery of services. It's recognised that the relationship between governments and citizens needs to change to allow more participation in decision making and greater inclusion of disadvantaged groups. And it's recognised that greater community engagement is necessary, particularly for working with disadvantaged uh, communities. And this push is in response to a number of major societal changes that have occurred in recent decades and which we are all familiar with. So rapid social change, 
um, has significantly altered the conditions under which families are raising their children. And while most people have benefited from these changes, poorly resourced families can find the heightened demands of contemporary living and parenting overwhelming. Um, and these changes have also altered the nature of the challenges faced by the service system. So we're now facing many more complex or so-called wicked social problems, and that's challenged the traditional service system's capacity to support them effectively. Now, this has created a need for service approaches that are more suited to the needs of contemporary families with community engagement as a potential strategy for ensuring that services are more responsive. So what's been tried in this context? Well, governments have responded to these challenges in a variety of ways. They've developed national frameworks of one kind or another through COAG to guide service improvement and coordination. We've uh, made attempts to try and build coordinated and more effective services and service systems, but we haven't focused nearly as much effort on building more supportive communities and improving the interface between communities and services, which is where uh, community engagement comes in. Governments have also tended to place more reliance upon killer programs or evidence-based programs that address the, the presenting problems rather than looking at the systemic or ecological conditions that lead to those problems in the first place. Um, Another response to the challenge of social change has been in the form of place-based or collective impact initiatives. And these involve a focus on the needs of specific communities, usually the most disadvantaged, rather than using a population-wide approach. Place-based approaches have a number of common features, and one of them is our topic for today, community engagement. Um, Sorry, um, the, however, community engagement represents a challenge for traditional forms of service delivery, uh, which are based upon forms of service devised and delivered by professionals or by governments, and usually without the meaningful involvement of consumers. So the notion of sharing responsibility or power with consumers is a challenge. We don't really know how to do that. So, before we proceed to talk about how we do it, we just need to be clear about what we're talking about. What is a community and what is community engagement? Um, a community can be thought of in two ways, as geographic entities that are homogeneous and uh, distinct units with common identity, or as the relationships that people have with others uh, where they live and on their sense of belonging. In fact, these two meanings of community are complementary and inseparable, and therefore we can define community as a group of people who reside in a specific location and to the relationships between them. Effective community engagement depends upon the relational bonds between members of the community, and therefore strengthening these bonds might be an important focus. This is the notion that we need to support families more effectively by um, building stronger links between them, as well as stronger links between the service system and these communities. So what's community engagement? There's no commonly agreed definition. The term is often used interchangeably with a number of other concepts, such as consultation, participation, collaboration, and empowerment. And all of these are related to community engagement, but don't capture all aspects of the concept. Community engagement is often depicted as a continuum ranging from a low level engagement strategy, such as consultation, to high level strategies, such as empowerment. And this is one model that's often presented, this public participation spectrum from the International Association for Public Participation, Australasia. And across the top, you've got the, a continuum from uh, informing people through to empowering them. 
So informing them, we're going to provide the public with a balanced information to help them understand it. Um, that's all we're going to do. When we consult with them, we're going to get some feedback and on alternative and so on, but we still make the decisions. If we involve them, we work directly with the public through the process to ensure that public concerns and aspirations are understood and considered. We, the professional and the government is still making the decisions, however. When we collaborate, we partner with the public in each aspect of decision making, including the development of alternatives and the identification. Now we're getting on to something that uh, approaches community engagement. There is a further um, list, further level listed there where final decision making is transferred completely to the hands of the, um, the public. Um, in fact, it's that fourth level um, which is the one um, uh, which is community engagement um, is really involved with and the one where you have a partnership. That is where both parties, the service provider or government and the client or the community are partners in making decisions, in sharing information, agreeing upon goals, developing strategies, delivering services, everything. Um, and that is more the kind of goal that we're um, thinking about here. So community engagement is a process whereby a service system proactively seeks out community values, concerns and aspirations, um, incorporates these values, concerns and aspirations into a decision-making process or processes and establishes an ongoing partnership with the community to ensure that the community's priorities and values continue to shape services and the service system. And it's that ongoing partnership with shared responsibility which is the essence of um, community engagement. The logic looks like this, if you can read it on your screens. Um, very quickly, uh, going from the left, if institutions genuinely wish to understand the aspirations and concerns of the values of the community. So you've got to start with a conviction that you really want to do this. And if they provide the resources needed to enable the community to share their aspirations and their concerns and their values. And if the community sh does this, um, and if these aspirations and concerns are incorporated into the plans and decisions that are made, then top box here, then the, the community will have um, greater trust and confidence in those institutions and the institutions will have a better understanding of the needs of the community. And that will in turn lead to greater uptake of services by community members. If they don't feel listened to, then they won't listen to us. And it will also lead to the services being provided addressing the issues of most concern to the community, and then you'll get an improved um, benefits from it. So a, a program logic there, each element of that can be measured and needs to be thought carefully about. The rationale, well, there are four reasons why we should be using a community engagement approach in future service development. One is that the traditional forms of services uh, are not succeeding in improving outcome. Um, and are not being fully utilised, especially by families with complex needs. Community engagement works. It can lead to improved outcomes um, and results in a greater sense of ownership and greater take up of services, better outcomes. The damaging effects of non-participation. If you don't participate, various forms of non-participation, if you can't access services or if you don't, aren't able to contribute meaningfully to services, etc. This is damaging for health and well-being. And finally, community engagement is a human right. Um, so what makes community engagement effective? It's a complex and dynamic social pro process that is uh, difficult to evaluate, particularly when assessing longer term outcomes. Nevertheless, there is now sufficient evidence that allows us to draw some conclusions and it's clear that it is beneficial um, and there is considerable 
convergent evidence for a common set of characteristics that look like this. You need to start from communities' own needs and priorities rather than from those that are dictated from outside. You need to invite and build local autonomy, giving leadership to people in the community and acting as a resource to them. You need to build the capacity of families and communities to meet their own needs um, more effectively, a very important element. You need to have a flexible service system that can be tailored to meet local needs. You need a balanced partnership based on mutual trust and respect. You need to work with communities and not do things for them or to them. You need to share information so that communities can make informed decisions and you need to provide communities with choices regarding services and intervention options rather than making the choices for them. In practice, community engagement is essentially relational. It occurs at a local level. It involves professionals who represent services and service systems building personal relationships with community members and groups based on mutual trust and respect. And that provides the basis for all other key aspects of community engagement, particularly joint decision making and capacity building. And this requires professionals who have a role to build relationships with community groups. Could I be either be a dedicated role or it could be part of their more general professional responsibilities. One of the things we need to think about how to create those roles. And the service system needs to be acting in a coordinated fashion if you're going to be able to respond flexibly. For parent groups, community engagement involves parent groups meeting regularly. Can't stress this too highly that one of the most important aspects of community engagement is you don't get a community, emergent community opinion unless parents meet with one another. Adding up the separate opinions of parents doesn't count. They need to meet with one another, to meet regularly with one another and to meet regularly with professionals for opinions to emerge that you can work with and respond to. And this means parents need opportunities to meet on a regular basis. Providing parents with opportunities to meet um, has direct benefits by building social networks, but also makes it easier for the community to engage with the service system. And efforts to engage communities can be initiated by governments, but also can be bottom up initiated by communities themselves. So the implications we would see is this. To build supportive networks and reduce social isolation, service systems should provide safe settings for families of young children to meet, ensure that streets are safe and easily navigable and ensuring that there is an efficient, affordable local transport system. These are the conditions that enable families to meet with one another on a regular basis. And we'll hear something about what a place like that does when we hear about the Tasmanian example. To avoid inadvertently causing stress and exhaustion in community members, we should check regularly as to whether we're asking too much of them. Coordinate with each other when multiple services are trying to engage the same community. We've got to avoid doing harm here. To avoid disillusioning communities uh, by promising something that isn't delivered, we should be prepared to honour the choices made through this community engagement process. To ensure community engagement and, and partnership become standard practice and sustainable, they need to be embedded in ongoing governance arrangements. To support community engagement at local <laughs> levels, government policies and funding should be designed to support local flexibility, respect local decision making and provide funding support to address locally determined objectives. And clearly that means freeing up monies that are currently tied up with fixed services, as it were. To ensure that professionals are being consistently true to community engagement principles and practices and are responding to collective family needs, you need to get regular feedback from communities. To enable professionals to engage communities effectively, uh, they will need training and support in a range of new skills, including relationship building, um, conflict 
resolution, negotiation, communication and knowledge management, not necessarily part of their original um, training. Um, the uh, relationship building is fundamental, so therefore training in how to build relationships and maintain relationships um, is a critical part of the professional tools we all need in this new world. To enable the service system to respond flexibly to community needs, agencies will need funding and staffing strategies that enable services to be reconfigured rapidly. That's one thing we don't do very well. We lock our resources up into a fixed um, pattern of service delivery. And if it turns out that we're delivering it in the wrong place or at the wrong time, with the, um, uh, then we need to be able to change um, rapidly to meet emerging family needs. And we need to give professionals time for community engagement activities. Uh, and their roles and job descriptions may need to be reconfigured. Um, it currently isn't built into people's time. Uh, people are generally flat chat and uh, can't see how they can spare time for this kind of work. And yet it should be seen as central. It becomes part of the role if we understand this as an essential part of what we're trying to do. Um, okay, time for Sue. And hopefully we've got Angela online to talk about an exemplary community engagement project. Thanks, Tim. And hi, everyone. Um, this is Sue speaking, and I'll introduce Angela in just a minute. Um, Tim has spoken really clearly about the um, implications for practice. And we're really lucky in Australia to have an incredible example of uh, really good practice of parent and community engagement in Tasmania with the Tasmanian Child and Family Centres. So what I want to do is just tell you a little bit about the Child and Family Centres as a context setter, and then I'll introduce Angela and the rest of this um, part of our input will be um, a conversation between Angela and I um, to uh, hear from her experience as a parent uh, involved in child and family centres in Tasmania. So the Tasmanian Child and Family Centres uh, have been funded by the Department of Education and Training in Tasmania with the aim to improve the health and wellbeing of children, uh, their education and care outcomes by supporting parents and enhancing accessible services in the local community. They've been established in uh, 12 disadvantaged communities across Tasmania through an extensive process over several years of community engagement and empowerment. And we'll hear a bit about that from Angela shortly. The process was guided by a learning and development strategy that was funded by the Tasmanian Early Years Foundation and uh, delivered by the Centre for Community Child Health. And our colleague, uh, uh, Paul Pritchard, who I'm sure many of you have met, the learning and development strategy emphasised genuine engagement for the, with the local community in the visioning, planning, designing, implementation and functioning of the child and family centres and as such was a really deliberate walking alongside both the government in terms of their intention for these uh, services to be developed in engaged ways, uh, but with the um, service providers on the ground in those 12 communities and with parents um, in each of those, those sites. So quite a deliberate uh, support strategy. The key features of the Tasmanian Child and Family Centres were um, that they were underpinned by the a family partnership model um, that was used to inform all the planning and operational processes. They were, as I said, the, the initiative was supported by a um, learning and development strategy funded by the Tasmanian Early Years Foundation. And that was really significant. I mean, I think that one of the things that um, has been important is Tasm in Tasmania is understanding that engagement isn't going to happen on its own. It actually needs to be uh, well resourced throughout the process um, of, of design, etc. The each uh, centre had its own local enabling group to guide the um, planning and the, the building of new facilities. And we might ask Angela a bit about that as well. 
and then uh, each had uh, an established working together agreement that were not just about how services were going to work together through this process, but how services and parents were going to work uh, in a collaborative way, in an engaged way through this planning and uh, implementation process. There were also uh, local governance groups that were established for each child and family centres and a range of um, other programs and initiatives that also equally adopted a, an engaged uh, process. And this is just one example, the Empowering Parents, Empowering Communities, which is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, parent, um, a parenting program. So Angela, this is where I'm going to bring you into the conversation. Can you just uh, let me know that you can hear me? How are you going? <laughs> Hi Angela and welcome to the conversation. Can you start just by telling us a bit about yourself and where you live? Um, I live in Clarendon Vale which is the Clarence Plains community. Um, I'm a single mother of five children and I'm a very active member in the community. And you're, um, you joined in in the very early days in with uh, your local child and family centre. Can you tell us how you got involved? Uh, I did join quite early. Um, I'm chairperson at the local primary school of the school association and our principal couldn't attend a meeting one day so she asked me to go along and take notes and that was the beginning of a journey that hasn't ended. <laughs> you, must have won, you, you, you mustn't have known what you were walking into at that point. Uh, so tell us, when you turned up, what did you um, what did you discover, and how did you get more involved in the process over time? Um, when I first attended the meeting, I walked in. It was a room full of people in suits with clipboards and folders. Um, I'd shown up in my trucky ducks. Um, I <laughs> sat around a big table and thought, "Oh my God, what am I doing here? I'm going to kill Anne when I get out." Um, and one of the members asked a question, um, and the question was, who was not being paid to be there? And I was the only person that put their hand up. And from that moment in, I was automatically made to feel comfortable because what it, what I had to say mattered. Yep, yep. So, um, so you attended that first meeting and, and felt valued in terms of, and, and also had a sense of authority by the sounds of it in terms of people turning to you for information. What was your, then your ongoing role in the design and planning phase for the Child and Family Centre? So then I, I, I kept up with the meetings and then the local enabling group was um, formed. So I joined that and I helped bring other community members into those meetings because from the early stages I realised it was about what we wanted and without the community members it wasn't going to happen. So it was just encouraging people to come along and, and you know, there was free food and, and childcare. So for some people it was really a social aspect as well but at the same time having a say in something that we were all going to get to use later on. So what was the role of the local enabling groups? I mentioned it um, a little bit earlier. Can you tell us a bit more about the function of that group? Um, so the local enabling group um, met every couple of weeks, sometimes once a week. We talked about the design of the building, what the building would entail, who would work from the building, everything to do with the building, colours, um, gardens, fittings the lot. So it wasn't just the small things, it was a larger scale. It was yep. everything that involved the building we had a say in. And how long were you meeting together as a group? Because obviously that was very early days and at some point there was um, drawings and architects and a building built and a launch and, you know, announcements and launches. But what, what sort of time frame did all of that take and how long were you in that planning phase for? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but it was definitely a couple of years. So um, it, it was constant meetings. And, and one thing that I did, I do remember is you've got to see something in our area to believe it. We're always told we're going to get things and 
it, it just doesn't happen. But with the child and family centres, having that involvement in those meetings certainly made me believe that we were going to get this great building that was going to, you know, enable our kids to have a better start. Um, seeing is believing. So, so it's really important then in... Uh, in an engagement process like that, that people really have are able to believe and trust that there's going to, something's going to happen uh, as a result of their input. Oh yeah, definitely. Especially in a low economical area like ours, I suppose people are, are promised things all the time, and you know sometimes those things can't be upheld. So yeah, definitely to see to see is to believe and. And the more people you get involved, so someone like me, I've lived here all my life. Um, I know a lot of people. People trust in what I say. So it's it's kind of getting that right person's foot in the door to start with and then building on that. Yep, yep. And so how were you and other parents supported to be able to participate? Oh, in every which way possible. Um Points were valid if we didn't understand something from an early stage, uh, have jargon and everything at these meetings. And we used to sit there thinking, oh, my God, I've got no idea what you're talking about. But quite quickly it was established that not everybody understands the jargon. So we were made to feel at ease if we had to ask what they were talking about or things were put in easier terms for us to understand. So we were never never made to feel any different than, you know, the head of, you know, some a, a, a huge organisation sitting beside us. We were all treated as equals and all given the opportunity to put into the centre. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that you um, talked about your first meeting being that you turned up in, in your tracky pants and everyone was in their professional clothing. And Paul Pritchard, who's, who's worked as part of the learning and development strategy, often would come back and talk to, with us at the centre about that, that issue about uh, the clothing people wore and how that could sometimes be a barrier. Did you notice any changes to the way people came, uh, professionals turned up and came to meetings as they got to know you and um, over time? I, it was definitely more relaxed as the meetings went on. And I suppose you, you look at it from both ways. Even though you're a professional, you may still feel uncomfortable working with a heap of community members that you don't know. So the barriers were dropped quite quickly because we all were treated as an equal. Yeah. So if someone was having a day off and they wanted to come along in their tracky ducks, they did. <laughs> so, and there was, no, yeah, there was no looking sideways or anything. It was just you came as you were and you were accepted as you were. You never felt uncomfortable in any way. Yep. And so over time the building was finished and you saw the, the all of those decisions that you'd spent hours poring over come to life. It must have been an incredible moment when, when uh, those buildings were finished and launched. How did your role change uh, after that point as, as parents um, engaged in the service? Hugely. Um to see the building open was amazing. At that stage, I was the mother of four children. Um, two and a half years ago, I gave birth to a little boy. So to be able to actually come through the centre as someone that could use it, not just be part of it, was a huge plus for me. Um, I've done public speaking. I've done TV interviews. I've done radio interviews. I've done interstate conferences. Um, it's, I've just gone ahead in leaps and bounds. I'm doing things now, like today, that I would never, ever dream of doing four years ago. Yeah, that's beautiful, Angela. So so not only have you, um, be, are you a service user of that um, centre in perhaps a way that you hadn't anticipated when you first got involved as a, a local parent, um, but your life has changed in, in other ways. Um, and so from the services perspective, when you spend time at the centre, what what is the contribution that parents make? Um, are they are they coming along to attend services or participate in groups, or, or are there other ways that parents are involved in the the planning of 
and delivery of services. Can you tell us a bit about that? I mean, it's all of the above, plus just to clarify, a lot of us live here every day. From the, day, the time we open to the, day, the time we shut, um, we sit around, we bring the kids up, um, we use the services, but at the same time, we encourage other people to use them. Yep. Um, we're able to help each other. Um, if, for instance, if I if I think one of my friend's children just you know something's not right there, I can have a chat to the child health nurse and alert her of the situation. She can't give me any information, but I feel better myself knowing that I've done something to help. Yep. Um, it gets a lot of us out of the house um, and confidence in a lot of us has gone above and beyond. Um, you know, we're answering phones, we're greeting and meeting people, um, we're, we're running workshops and it's just everything above and beyond. Yep. Okay, thanks. And in, in involving um, parents in service planning and delivery, as Tim was talking about, is meant to result in better a better match of services to the needs of parents. Do you think that's been the case for you? And can you give us an example? Uh, definitely has been the case. We have a couple of young girls in the area who are both in wheelchairs. Um, both parents were travelling out to Newtown, which is a 20 to 30 minute drive from here, a couple of times a week for um, physio and speech therapy and occupational therapy. They can now actually access all those services in the one building, mm, five minutes from their front door. So that makes a huge difference. So, yeah. And we were able to, to deliver that to the girls by talking to the parents and finding out what their needs were. Yep. Fantastic. So the other claim about involving parents in uh, the planning and delivery of services is um, that it has benefits for the person, as in you, um, in terms of learning new um, skills and knowledge. Has your experience with the Child and Family Centre changed how you think about your future employment or, or what you might contribute in the future? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I actually do some relief hours here at our centre, um, which, like, I love volunteering, but to actually be paid occasionally for those hours um, certainly makes you feel valued and that the work you put in is definitely rewarded in the end. Um, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old son, as I mentioned, and when I'm ready to go back to work, I definitely want to be involved in a child and family centre more so than I am now. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. So there's a whole bunch of workers, uh, professionals on listening in on this conversation, Angela. What would your advice be to them uh, about how they can um, involve parents in the design or improvement of services? What sort of things should they be thinking about doing to support parents to get involved? I can tell you now, our service providers here will come and sit with us and have a coffee. Um, we're like family. It's not so much a centre, it's a family centre. Um, we're all friends. It, it's making people believe in themselves and that's where my centre leader comes into it. He doesn't actually force me to do things, but he does in a roundabout way with, with me not realising that he's doing it. So it's, it's enabling parents to do things that you know that they can do with a little bit of encouragement and it's listening, you know. They know what they need. It's just a matter of getting into that conversation and and really listening to their needs and their wants. And when you hear it, if you can provide it, go full speed ahead. Because as I said, seeing is believing. <laughs> it's a very strong message that's coming through. Is there anything you would suggest that, we avoid doing so what are so there are some things that worked really well for you and they're they're coming through strongly are there things that didn't go so well and things that uh, as professionals we should think you know try to avoid doing in terms of uh, the parent community engagement um that's a really hard one because my experience has been a hundred percent great from the start but it, i suppose it comes back to just listen and and encourage your community members and let them know that they're valued 
And that was a big thing for me. I was valued from early on. So I never really had the bad experiences because I was made to feel important from day one. Yeah, I love that. And so I think um, one of the t things that Tim and I refer to in the presentation is uh, that it's important in when engaging parents that we're engaging them on things that we have the power to do something about. And it, that message is coming through really clearly from you as well, that being able to trust in the process uh, enough to engage with it is on the it can be achieved on the basis that you know that something's going to be done with the things you've had a say about. In finishing, what would your message be if this was a if there were a bunch of parents uh, who might be thinking about getting involved in a child and family centre today, listening in on this conversation? What would your key message be uh, to them? Oh, look, if you can walk through the door, you'll never look back. Um, the, the, the confidence you get from doing things in your in your local centres and the empowerment you're an important person and whether you believe it or not, you have something to offer. Beautiful. Thank you, Angela. And I'm going to hand over back to Mary now to um, facilitate the rest of the seminar, webinar.